Tonight on Huckabee, Pennsylvania Congressman Guy Rischenthaler, Daily Wire host Michael Knowles, comedy and stunt performer Matt Baker, Natasha Owen celebrates freedom in song. That's Trey Corley in the Music City Connection. And I'm your announcer, Keith Bilbrey. And now, here's Mike Huckabee! And welcome, everybody. Great studio audience. And if you've never been to our show in person, go to Huckabee.tv, get some free tickets, and come and be with us. I promise you'll have a great time. You really will. Just ask these people. They're already having a good time, and we're just getting started. I'm sure you know this, but midterm elections are this Tuesday. Yes. Now, maybe you early voted like my wife and I did. If so, it's too late to change your vote. That is, unless, of course, you live in one of those states where you can just let a dead person vote for you again. But for most of us, we know we only get one ride, and once we use our ticket, we're done. There are a lot of factors that might influence your vote, and I realize that your focus might be different than mine. But just for the record, here's how I decide how to vote. And it isn't straight party voting, even though I am indeed a Republican. Above all, I will not support or vote for a candidate who believes that it's okay to kill an unborn baby for any reason at any time. I just know. I personally am deeply committed to the science of life that holds that a human life begins at conception and is loved by and purposed by God and that we should protect life until natural death. Now, look, I know there are some people who maybe hold to certain exceptions, but I simply don't think any person is worthless, expendable, disposable, or of less value than another person. Even a pregnancy that may have started by an evil act can be used by God for an eternal purpose. As Joseph told his brothers, Genesis, what you intended for harm... God has used for good. It's nice to support candidates who agree with my views on border security, taxes, support for the police and energy policy. But the deal breaker for me is that I just won't support a person who thinks it's okay to kill babies. My political action committee, HUCPAC, is going to give over $4 million directly to candidates across America this election cycle. And every one of them has to declare that they're pro-life. I simply don't know how I can even pray and say, God bless America, if I'm also helping to elect people who would be part of infanticide. It's especially troubling that while black people make up only 13% of the population, over 39% of all abortions are performed on black babies. More black babies are aborted in New York City than are even born in New York City. Targeting black children for death Look, I think that's the most blatant form of racism. And I don't know why any black voter would vote for a politician who would support targeting black babies for slaughter. And if, uh, if you're a Christian and you're troubled by voting for someone whose personal life is less than stellar, maybe even scandalous, look, I understand your struggle. I really do. I mean, let's face it, though, some doctors have horrible bedside manner, but they're great surgeons. And if the operation is to save the life of my family member, quite frankly, I want the best surgeon, not necessarily the nicest one. The mail carrier who brings my mail is a very nice person. But even if she wasn't, I'd really prefer one who got my mail to me accurately each day, but who was rude and unfriendly over one who was sweet and kind, but misdelivered 40% of my mail or just plain lost it. And if the mechanic who works on my car or the plumber who fixes my faucet is the nicest guy in town, but my car 
still won't get out of the driveway and I've got water knee deep in my house. Hey, I'll take a grouchy mechanic or a grouchy plumber any day because I'm picking performance over personality and in politics, principles over personality. Sure, I'd love to have the people working for me to all love God, pray a lot, memorize scripture and sing in the church choir. But I hire people to get a specific job done. And if they can't or won't do it, I'll fire them and I'll get someone who can or who will. And even if you think you're voting for a nice person, they may not be that nice after all. If a candidate you support doesn't serve according to your principles of what's right or wrong, then you're supporting policies that are going to adversely impact your family and perhaps your religious liberty. Hey, I'd love for all the candidates I vote for to be godly and spiritual. But as my boyhood pastor used to say, God can hit a straight lick with a crooked stick. So I don't vote for those who will just lower my taxes. I want to vote for those who will fight for the issues that I care about, even if they don't do it for the right reason. I'm really not as partisan as I probably seem, but I will admit that I've asked my family one major request, that when I die, please don't let me vote Democrat. <laughs> right after the break, we're going to be joined by House Appropriations Committee member Congressman Guy Reschenthaler with some valuable insights into some of your top issues this election season. So don't go away. We'll be right back. Later, Michael Knowles breaks down the midterm landscape. Then Christian Music's Natasha Owens proudly celebrates the red, white, and blue on Huckabee. Go to MikeHuckabee.com and sign up for his free newsletter and follow at GovMikeHuckabee on Twitter. And welcome back. Guy Reschenthaler represents Pennsylvania's 14th district in the U.S. Congress. And after two years of one-party rule, the Democrats' main achievements are skyrocketing inflation and a looming recession. But we're going to ask the congressman if Republicans have a plan to reverse the damage that's made Americans poor and put the country deeper in debt. Please welcome to the show, Congressman Guy Reschenthaler. Congressman, great having you here. Governor, thanks for having me on. really appreciate it. You know, you are one of the only people in Congress that is unopposed for election. I've always said there's only two ways to run for office, unopposed or scared. <laughs> you actually are running unopposed. That's amazing. It's the, I've been running for office for almost 10 years now. It's the first time I've had no primary, no general. But it's really a testament to my district and the folks in it that it, because of their support, I'm now freed up to go around the country and help other folks campaign. So, and I'm focused a lot on the Dr. Oz race too for the Senate. So, but it's the support back home that enables me to do that. So tell us, how's that one gonna turn out? I can't imagine that people would vote for John Fetterman and not because of his stroke, but because of his crazy views on everything. Will Dr. Oz pull that out? I'm confident Dr. Oz wins this thing by three or four percent. And, and, really? and you're exactly right. It's not the health issue. Yeah. I tell people don't attack Fetterman on his health. Yeah. It's his policies that are really bringing him down. I mean, this is a guy that wants to release one third of all prisoners in the state of Pennsylvania. Do, a, do away with cash bail. He wants to do away with second degree murder. And anybody that's in prison for second degree murder, just release them. And we're dealing with crime that's spiking in Philadelphia, spiking in Pittsburgh. Literally in Philadelphia, it's the highest murder. We're on track to have the highest murder act, or, uh, uh, highest murder rate in the history of them keeping that stat. So as long as Dr. Oz focuses on crime, the economy, the fracking issue, he's going to win by three or four percent. I'm intrigued by the fact you served in the U.S. Navy. You were in the JAG Corps. Um, so you've done service in uniform. As a member of Congress, how much is that helpful that you have served the country when you're voting on military appropriations? Does it give you a better insight, a little more sense of, you know, these guys are not getting the support they need? It does, especially when you're trying to fight for increased pay for the enlisted members of our military that are grossly underpaid. But it's also about a sense of service. I, I view uh, serving in Congress 
as just a continuation of my service in the military. Well, you know, I, I, I'm impressed, and you said that it was a testament to the people of your district. It's a testament to you that nobody says, yeah, I'm gonna run against that guy because he's no good. Uh, I mean, it's, it's a wonderful thing to be in the position you are. You're also a person that's been on the fast track to leadership. You're gonna be one of the appropriators when Republicans take over the House. Most people may not understand, that's not something that typically happens in the first even 10 years of a congressman's tenure. You're going to be there after what, four years? I, I'm heading, yes, I'm uh, um, on appropriations now, got there in my sophomore term, but, uh, and hopefully I'll be on there next, uh, next year as well. But, you know, I got into Congress. I had no desire to be on the Appropriations Committee. I was on Judiciary and Foreign Affairs, which, yeah. of, course, of course, fit my background. But I quickly realized that because I have so many different interests, the only way I can touch everything I want to touch is through the appropriations process because everything has to run through appropriations. So I, I made an effort, got on appropriations. I'm on the state and foreign ops subcommittee. So it's so I got the foreign affairs aspect of that and then energy and water, which is incredibly important to my district. Yeah. Well, I just think it's uh, extraordinary that you're going to be in, in a position of ex real power because that's what the appropriators have is, is real power. Not just making speeches, but making the decisions that affect everything else that happens in Congress. Congressman, I'd love to get a little comfort from you. Tell me that if Republicans really get this majority, you're not going to squander it. You're going to go in and hold some people accountable for the abuses of government. You know, Governor, everywhere I go, I'm talking to folks, and that's their biggest concern, that we're going to have a repeat of what we had in the past. But I tell everybody, this is a different Republican Party. If you look at Congress, for example, the House, over 50% of those, those members were you know, Republican members, came in with either Trump at the top of the ticket or when he was in mm. the White House. This has really been a party that shifted to a mere the MAGA agenda much more than it has in the past. And if you look at the leaders, Kevin McCarthy will be speaker, yeah. much more conservative than speakers we've had in the past. Yes, indeed. Uh, Whip Scalise will be leader, Great guy. very conservative. Uh, Tom Emmer likely will be the incoming whip. These are very conservative members, and it's going to be a different kind of conference than what we had under former speakers. But aren't you a little worried, Congressman? I mean, Joe Biden says that these MAGA Republicans are a threat to democracy. I'm very excited that we're when we take back the House because we're going to have robust oversight and investigation. We're going to, we're, frankly, we're going to make Joe Biden wish that the last election didn't go the way it did. Uh, but. We're going to look at Fauci. We're going to look at Hunter Biden. Uh, we're going to look at... Uh, You've got a lot of support across yeah. the country yeah. to do that. But I think Fauci will actually have his own parking spot at the plaza because we're <laughs> going to call him in so much. But we're also, we're also going to focus on the uh, commitment to America, which yeah. Kevin McCarthy uh, ruled out. And it's... it's basically like a revamp of the contract with America, but it says what we want to do. And it's really simple, four, four pillars, uh, an economy that's strong, a nation that's safe, a future built on freedom, and a government accountable to the people. Very, very simple, straightforward. And if we just focus on those four things, we're really going to make a difference, and we're going to set up the stage for a Republican takeover of the White House in 24. You know, if that all happens... There's going to be a lot of Americans quite happy. And I think a lot of people, even who are Democrats, are going to be pleasantly surprised that you focus on things that matter. Mm -hmm. uh, wh when I heard the president's speech last night, I'm thinking, is he that out of touch that he never mentioned the border? He never mentioned the economy or inflation. He never mentioned crime, not once. And he, all he talked about was um, what happened to Paul Pelosi, which was horrible. Nobody is, is anything but disgusted by that. But it's almost like that he, he was oblivious to the fact that 330 Americans are really hurting out there. You know, Governor, I think that so often people in Washington, D.C., they, they just live in this echo chamber. They're talking to each other. They're not going back like we are back to the district, uh, flying around the country. And they just get caught up in these tracks. But what they don't realize is if you ask the average voter what they care about, it's inflation, it's the economy, it's crime, it's education. And all four of those, the top four things that individuals are concerned about, they trust Republicans much more than they trust the Democrats. That's why this environment is so good for us heading into these midterm elections. That's why I think we're going to have one of the largest majorities of Republicans that we've had in, a, in 100 years. And I, that's, it's possible. Yeah. And uh, if you look at it, 
the president's party typically loses 27 seats on average in the midterm elections. And the country is ready for some significant improvement in the way things are being handled. Congressman, it is a pleasure to have you here. Thanks for having me. From the time I first met you, I said, this guy has got his head screwed on straight, one of the smartest people we've got, and I'm thrilled you're on the Appropriations Committee. Now, for our audience, head over to Huckabee.tv. You can follow the congressman on social media and find out more about the work that He's not just doing for the people of Pennsylvania, but for all of America. Right now, we're going to check in with Keith Bilbrey. He's actually doing a little work for the show, and he'll tell us what's coming up next. Well, get ready to duck. Hilarious comic juggler Matt Baker is next on Huckabee. to the music of the Jackson Five. I want you back. See, I knew that tune, because I remember when they were coming out and Michael was just a little guy. I would do a moonwalk for all of you tonight, but I don't want to take that much time for the show and I don't want to break one of my legs. So there you go. But I will say we have the best band in America. They're right here, Trey Corley and the Music City Connection. Give them a big hand. My next guest's unique combination of comedy, juggling, and daring stunts has wowed audiences in 17 nations, as well as on top TV shows like The Last Comic Standing and America's Got Talent. He also happens to hold five Guinness World Records. Please give a big welcome. You're going to love him, Matt Baker. Thank you, Governor. I appreciate it. Hi, everybody. Hey. Thank you. Uh, my name is Matt Baker, or as they refer to me in Mexico, as El Diablo Blanco, which I think roughly translates to your handsome man. Now, I, I specialize in unusual skills, and I'm gonna demonstrate a few of those skills for you this evening. Now, the first skill I'm gonna do is I'm gonna kick a bowling ball off of my foot, and I'm gonna catch it on my face, yeah. It's a real bowling ball. It is seven pounds, six ounces, or 3.2 kilos for those of you watching in England, right? They don't, they don't like teach that conversion in American schools, right? I just read an article that ranks US public education system against other countries and different subjects. In math, we're 25th. We're behind Ireland. It's like, who knew that learning to count by singing 99 balls of beer on the wall is effective, right? <laughs> we are 19th in geography. We're behind a bunch of countries I've never even heard of. Uh -uh. <laughs> Yeah. Okay, all right, nice. I actually know the conversion because I was homeschooled until my parents found out. And uh, I, was, I was actually homeschooled, I hated it. I don't think kids should ever get economics credit for watching The Price is Right, right? I can't tell you what 15 divided by two is, but I can sure tell you how much you should pay for a front-loading washing machine. All right, so I'm gonna kick it off my foot, I'm gonna catch it on my face. All right, bowling ball to the face, oh yeah. If I could have everyone at home and everyone in the studio audience count down from three, three, two, one. Seriously, guys, jeez. No, no one's gonna stop me, governor, nothing, jeez. It's like, yeah, mess it up. All right, that's not even the weirdest thing I do. Check this one out, this is so weird. You're gonna love this. Yeah, I know. That is so weird. Can you believe someone married me? <laughs> right? I actually did. I got married during the lockdown because uh, we ran out of things to watch on Netflix. And, uh, and my, my wife is hilarious. I said to my wife, I'm like, we should get tattoos of our wedding rings on our fingers. And she's like, no way, tattoos are forever. <laughs> I know. She's not only funny, she's the most smart person I know. She's a PhD scientist and she married me, right? She's so smart, her SAT score is triple my credit score. 
Uh, uh, the reason I talk about her because she told me I needed to do a trick today on Huckabee's show. Now, this is her favorite trick in my show. It involves three household objects. It involves a balloon, a stick, and a vase. Now, what's going to happen is I'm going to put the vase on top of the balloon, and all that will be resting on top of a stick I have in my mouth. I'll pop the balloon. It will drop the vase down and land perfectly balanced on the stick I have in my mouth. What? Settle down, folks. Settle down, all right? Now, this is made of latex. It might fly out into the studio audience. Does anyone have a latex allergy that we should know about? Okay, cool. Just want to be conscientious of allergies. They're so popular right now, all right? Now, I grew up in an allergenic household. My brother was deathly allergic to peanuts. We couldn't have peanuts at the house. We couldn't go to baseball games. We couldn't even watch Charlie Brown cartoons. <laughs> it's crazy. Hey, that joke is dumb. All right, here we go. <laughs> what are you What are you Big trick. <laughs> <laughs> Pretty cool, huh? Oh, oh, I know, I know. This is what I do for a living, <laughs> right? A lot of people are surprised at that. They're like, you can make money doing this? It's like, yeah, how do you think I make my payments on my 2001 Kia Sorento? <laughs> Right? <laughs> and I know there's a lot of kids watching at home, and I hope this be an inspiration to the kids who are watching. Look what you can accomplish when you don't listen to your high school guidance counselors. <laughs> All right, here we go. Let's give it a shot. Follow the blue. Right here. Oh, yeah. Yeah, all right. That was my mom's favorite routine. That's for you, mom. Yeah. She's not dead. I don't know why I do that. <laughs> She's, she just likes a different routine. All right. Now, we'll do the bowling ball in the face. All right. Now, I'm not quite sure you understood the gravity of the situation. I'm going to kick a bowling ball at my foot and catch it on my face. Now, uh, Governor, I know you are a musician. Would you help me build the theatrical tension for the audience and give me a little drum roll? Would you mind sure. doing that? Here you go. All right. All right. The governor on the drum, catching a bowling ball on my face. <laughs> I'm not sure how I thought this day was going to go. All right, here we go. That's good. That's really, it's like a Civil War reenactment. Here we go. Here we go. On the face. <laughs> Hit the symbol. The symbol. Yeah. Right on cue. That was perfect. There it is. <laughs> that's it for me, guys. Thank you so much. Oh, that's that great. Excellent. That was so good. Oh, that was awesome. Thank you very much for having me. I have a feeling you're going to want to see more of the amazing Matt Baker. I certainly do. If you want to, simply go to Huckabee.tv. We're juggling all the links that you're going to need to find him. Maybe invite him to your community or to an event you're having in your town. Right now, Keith, don't drop the ball. Tell us what's coming up next. Uh, stick with the bass, Mike. Uh, straight ahead, Michael Knowles of the Daily Wire weighs in on Tuesday's elections. And later, Christian music star Natasha Owens performs on Huckabee. November the 7th, Eric Stackelbeck's Restoring America special is going to tackle the major issues confronting American citizens. As the United States is faced with an out-of-control level of inflation, the pervasive woke movement, growing crime, and a gathering storm of global threats, it's clear that a new course is desperately needed for our country. But what role can people of faith play in helping to lead this American restoration? Eric Stackelbeck tackles these issues and a whole lot more on Restoring America. It's airing the day before the election, Monday, November the 7th, 8 p.m. Eastern, 7 p.m. Central, and it's going to be right cheer, right cheer on TBN. Where else would you see great programming like that? Well, speaking of Restoring America, my next guest is also hard at work doing just that. 
Michael Knowles hosts The Michael Knowles Show over at The Daily Wire. What a unique name for The Michael Knowles Show to be named after Michael Knowles, who is the host of The Michael Knowles Show. But he's also a best-selling author. He's one of the most renowned works, uh, which is a book called Reasons to Vote for Democrats. Yeah, he wrote that book. By the way, it's completely empty. Every page in it is blank. <laughs> Several years later, I suspect he's found even fewer reasons to vote for them. Please welcome back to the show, Michael Knowles. Great to have you back. I remember when that book came out, I thought it was the funniest thing I'd seen because I saw this big, thick book and it said all the reasons to vote for Democrats. I said, I got to interview this guy. Well, Governor, I, I have to thank you for <laughs> plugging my magnum opus because, <laughs> you know, it's truer now than ever. I guess I really should thank Joe Biden because if anyone is going to sell more copies of that book, yeah. it is going to be this man. I think it might hit number one again. It could be. It, it may go right to the top of the bestseller list. Michael, you speak at a lot of college campuses. It's one of the things that you do, which is a brave thing on your part in these days. What is your sense from college students that you see on the university campus? Do they scream and yell at you? Do they throw things at you? Are, are there some kids out there that are actually listening? Four or five years ago, you would, I would show up to campuses, I was physically attacked at one campus, you'd have major protests, you'd have people yelling at you in the room. And I've noticed that in the last few years, and, and especially after COVID, yeah. more people are showing up. The audiences are bigger than ever, but there aren't so many attacks, there aren't so many protests. And I think one, one reason for that is the liberals realized that we were making them look extremely foolish on, on air, and so they stopped showing up. But two, I think there has been an actual sea change. And I think that that is what you are seeing reflected in the polls right now, yeah. what you are seeing with suburban moms and what you're seeing in people all around the country, that is actually being reflected on the college campuses too. And I think they're realizing something has gone seriously wrong here. Something is broken. Even though Joe Biden is trying to buy off all their votes and yeah. give student loans and just give away all of our taxpayer money, I don't think it's really working. I think you are seeing campuses come back to normal. You know, it's fascinating you say that, and, I, and I'm thrilled to hear it. What are the issues driving that? Because I think the Democrats thought that if they just pushed abortion on demand at any time, young people would love that. But it appears that young people are not that crazy about abortion. They'd kind of like to be able to one day own a house and a car and have a career. That's right. I think the Democrats made the wrong choice on the social issues. They put all their eggs in the abortion basket. And the, the polls reflect people just don't vote on abortion. I actually do vote on abortion because yeah. I'm very pro-life. I'm sure you vote on abortion. I'm sure a lot of people yeah. in this room do. But it's only about 15% of the electorate that votes on that. And it's about 50-50, so you're talking about 7.5%, 7.5%. Most people are not, and, and the momentum is with pro-life. You especially see it with the social issue of transgenderism. The Democrats yeah. have, have really doubled down on... Uh, putting people through these horrible mutilations and procedures, very expensive, very traumatic, completely out of touch with reality at younger and younger ages. And I think they thought this was the progressive wave of the future. But people have eyes and they have ears and they have senses. They, they can see boys are not girls and girls are not boys. And this is causing all sorts of trauma. You are now seeing, yeah. and this is really important, you know, We've been predicting this for a long time, but now the transgender craze has gone on long enough that there are people who have had their lives severely damaged by this, who have had their bodies mutilated, who have irreversible damage. And we now have the detransitioners telling their stories and saying what was inflicted on us was abusive. I needed psychological help and you butchered me and you put me on this horrible course of med medical treatment that's yeah. very expensive, damaging my life. And, and people are hearing those stories and it's the young people who are hearing those stories. And so I think, you know, if the, if the Democrats believed they were on the cusp of generational change, I think that is coming right back and biting them. Wow, that is, I can't tell you how encouraging it is. And we're also seeing the potential that this election in just a few days, I mean, could be an extraordinary uh, just shock to the system of the entire body politic. If you had a prediction to make, how many Senate seats will the Republicans pick up 
What do you think happens in the House? I think it is not inconceivable that you've got a world where, forget about 51 Republican Senate seats, where you're looking more like 52, 53. I think 54 is not out of the question. Now, of course, we need to make sure that no water mains break in Georgia at 2 in the morning. <laughs> we know we got to make sure that no, no uh, ballots show up in yeah. Philadelphia in the middle of the night. But, but all of the indicators are so extraordinarily positive. And something that's r really leading all of this, and it ties into what we were just talking about, is that the Republican candidates that are doing really, really well they're not only talking about cutting your taxes. Yeah. I like tax cuts. I like keeping more of my money. I don't want Joe Biden to have more of my money. Right. I don't want those 87,000 IRS agents to show up at my door. But life is about more than tax cuts. Yes, and, they are. And the, the candidates who are really leading right now, I think they're, you look at J.D. Vance in Ohio. Yeah. He's talking about how we need pro-family policies, about how the family is the basic political union. We've got to support the family. We've got, to, we've got to stop this craziness with drugs that is killing people, that's reducing the average life expectancy. Mm -hmm. You look at Blake Masters running in Arizona. He is neck and neck right now with Mark Kelly. No one thought he would get this close. Blake Masters is talking about how you really ought to be able to raise a family in America on a single income. And we've got to restore our traditional American values, restore our border, turn our country back to God and away from the craziness that we've all been worshiping, these false idols for years. Th those are the candidates who are winning. And it goes right back to that Glenn Youngkin race. Yeah. Glenn Youngkin, when he won in Virginia, he wasn't just talking about taxes. Yeah. He was saying parents have the right to, uh, to talk about their kids' education, prevent radical transgenderism, radical racial theories in the schools. That is the winning issue. And it's, it's bad news for the GOP establishment that doesn't want to talk about the cultural issues. But that's where, what the people care about right now, is they feel they're losing their country and they feel this might be the last moment to take it back. Let's hope so. We're so close. And I want to thank you for the advocacy that you and others at The Daily Wire have championed in free speech. Desperately needed. So very grateful for that. I have a feeling you're going to want to check out The Michael Knowles Show over at The Daily Wire. And you can. Plus, we also are going to give you connections to Michael's social media pages, all at Huckabee.tv. You go there, we'll connect you to Michael and The Daily Wire. Keith Bilbrey is going to connect us up with a little bit of what we still have yet to find on the show. Keith? Well, next, we head to Ohio for our kind of town. Then the show goes to the dogs with Angela Chapman of the new Leash on Life Animal Shelter on Huckabee. Huckabee.tv and get your very own Made in the USA Huckabee mugs, t-shirts, and more. Well, I don't know about you, but I've got an itch to visit some more of America's heartland. And I hear that Keith Bilbrey has a wonderful place for us to explore in some great Amish country on our kind of town. In the very heart of Ohio's Amish country is the wonderful town of Millersburg. Founded in 1865, Millersburg is the gateway to Ohio's Amish country, which has the largest Amish settlement. The whole downtown is registered as a national and historic area. The courthouse was built in 1885 and has trap doors leading to a tunnel below. Wonder what they're sneaking in or out. This Victorian house was built in 1902, a magnificent example of Queen Anne style architecture. It contains beautiful antiques, local artifacts, as well as an eerie past. Ever heard of carnival glass collectors? Well, you have now. And some of their most prized possessions come from the Millersburg Glass Company. Founded in 1909, they produce thousands of pieces that are the pride of Millersburg Glass Museum. There's no rough housing in this place. Millersburg is home of the popular Holmes County Annual Antique Festival. Two days of markets, arts, crafts, and demonstrations that provide fun for the whole family. Millersburg was voted as one of the best places in the world to see colorful fall foliage by National Geographic. It's a place to come to relax and unwind and appreciate God's handiwork. 
Experience Amish country on the rails to trails. The trail is 12 miles long and allows walkers, bikers, and buggies. Yes, you heard that right. There's a buggy lane. Watch where you step, though, because horses frequent the trail. You may go home with a little souvenir on your shoe. In November, it's the annual Christmas open house and chocolate walk. Buy an empty box, then go from store to store, picking up your chocolates handmade by our very own Troyer Sweet Shop. Say cheese. The area is famous for it. Stop by Guggensburg Cheese Factory Home for the original Baby Swiss. Stop in to view cheese making and sample over 60 varieties of delicious cheese. A more simple time at a beautiful little town that has so much to offer. Oh, and don't forget the pastries for goodness sakes. Mm -hmm. And that's why Millersburg, Ohio is our kind of town. That looks like a fun place to go. I like that. Thank you, Keith. And a big thanks to historic downtown Millersburg, Holmes County Historical Society, and Live More TV for helping us explore this great town. I hope you'll plan your own trip to Millersburg, Ohio. Now, to get some information on when to go, how to go, and all the things about it, just go to Huckabee.tv. We have a link to everything you'll need just to make that great trip. And I bet you will. Well, everyone loves little puppies and kittens, but have you ever thought that older animals need loving homes as well as the puppies? And they sometimes can be the best companions of all. November is Senior Pet Adoption Month. Didn't know you even had that, did we? Well, here to tell us more is the director of the new Leash on Life Animal Shelter in Lebanon, Tennessee, along with her special friends. Please welcome Angela Chapman. Angela, welcome. <laughs> It's a pleasure. Thank you so much. I love the name, New Leash on Life. Yes. And it's something I think most of us don't think about, that there are older dogs and cats, but we are talk mostly dogs because I'm a dog guy. Sure. That's the way we work. Uh, they're older dogs that need places to live. Absolutely. Statistically in shelters, you have senior dogs, dogs over five, dogs over seven, that just stay in the shelter a lot longer, even though they have you know, great things to offer and can be great companions. And, and why do these dogs end up in a shelter, the older dogs? So, I mean, it's lots of different reasons. Sometimes it's, you know, an owner passed away or a family situation changed and people are just trying to do the right thing. They know if the dog comes into our care, they're going to be safe. They're going to be taken care of until they find a new home. So sometimes we're just a landing for a tough situation. Sometimes it's, you know, hoarding or, you know, puppy mills, those things that you see in the news very oh, often. Yeah. You just, there's such a, a myriad of reasons why they wind up with us. You, you must love animals to be able to do this and, and, and the joy of being able to connect an older dog with a family. Right, and the, and the biggest thing for us is when they often come in, you know, kind of timid, kind of unsure, because they've been with a family for many yeah. years, and like, what's going on? And to see them kind of come out of their shells and connect with us, and then also connect with a new family, it, it is pretty rewarding. Angela, sometimes they're tough situations where the dog is not just old, but is infirm. Dog has, uh, you know, maybe diabetes or uh, glaucoma or other issues, maybe even cancer, yep. but they still need a place to be and a family to love them. That's right. So can, can you find families that are willing to take in a dog knowing that dog's not going to be there for the next 10, 20 years? So it's a little tougher, but what we find is if we can get someone just to try with one of the older dogs, it very often will work out. And we do a sleepover at our facility, so it gives people the chance to just spend time with the animal for mm. up to a week. So it's not this, hey, here you go, figure it out. It is, let's walk through this with you and let's help you make sure this is a good fit. You know, I have a feeling you brought some friends with you. To, I might have, yes. <laughs> if you did, I think it'd be time to bring them out and be great. let us see some, some dogs. Yes. All right, let's bring out the dogs. So we've got Jennifer, and you have two beautiful dogs with you. Both of these dogs are older dogs. Yes. How old is the Chihuahua? So this is Tia, and she is six years old. 
And um, she actually just came to us because she was abandoned. Hmm. And we're just getting to know her, but we figured out tonight that she's potty trained, so we're pretty excited about that. <laughs> <laughs> I know some people in this audience that aren't potty trained, so <laughs> we're already way ahead here. <laughs> Jennifer, that's a terrier mix, probably? Terrier mix is Tony Soprano. Tony Soprano is yeah. his name. He's about 11. <laughs> well, I bet he'll bite, won't he? <laughs> no, no, not Tony. Never. So how, Tony is 11? Mm -hmm. He's about 11, yeah. He just, but he's uh, got some health challenges, I understand. Yeah, he was just this year diagnosed with diabetes and he uh, went blind and so he had cataract surgery. So um, got his vision back. He's very happy to see bunnies and cows and <laughs> mom and dad again, so. Well, Jennifer is one of those people that really is a great example of someone trying the idea of taking home a senior. Yeah. She she adopted a senior from us just kind of through a series of events and and she was such a great home that we convinced her to adopt a few more. <laughs> Jennifer, <laughs> there are probably some people saying, "Wow, I wonder if I could do that." You've done this several times taking older dogs in. Well, tell me about the, not so much the challenge, we understand uh -huh. that. What's the joy of it? Um it's they kind of get happy again. It's kind of like they get a little bit of joy and that they can just kind of relax and enjoy the later part of their years. They know where their food is going to come from. Mm. They know they're going to get love every night. They know they're going to have a soft bed to live in. You and know, they don't sleeping. always know this, but she has an Instagram page for each of them. Wow. So. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. How many dogs have you been able to place? So our, our shelter uh, adopts a brown 160 to one, uh, to 200 a year. 200 a mm -hmm. year? Yes. And how many of those came to my house? Yeah. And, and a bunch of those are at Jennifer's yeah. house, right? Yeah. So it, are there other places like this around the country? Sure, absolutely. Um, and we all are, uh, some of us, like, we take in probably 10 to 15% of the dogs we take in are seniors. Some places focus just on seniors. Some places don't take animals over a certain age because they know they're going to be in their shelter longer. We all kind of have a different philosophy on that. Well, we're so glad to have both Tony Soprano and Tia with us, but more importantly, we're happy to have Angela and Jennifer. Thank you for what you do. You know, for those of us who absolutely love dogs, I say I would never live in a world without them. I just don't want to live in a world without dogs. They're God's great gifts to us. And I hope people will go to your website and maybe say, this is the time our family needs a pet and we will adopt one of these beautiful, beautiful dogs and bring them home. And I thank you. God for you for what you're doing. What Thank a so wonderful much. work Thank you. of love and compassion. <laughs> if you want to share your home and your heart with a senior pet, or maybe help support them, because they need your support, you can help the new Leash on Life shelter. If you visit Huckabee.tv, we have connections to take you to their website, and uh, maybe this is just what you've been looking for. Hey, speaking of old dogs, right now, an old dog is going to do an old trick because we're going to ask Keith Bilbury to tell us what's coming up next on the show. Well, <clears throat> thank you, I guess. That's easy. Prepare to feel patriotic with Christian Music's Natasha Owens on Huckabee. Huckabee is joined by guest Brigadier General Jeffrey McCarter and award-winning vocal group Avalon Worship. You may already know tonight's musical guest. She's an award-winning Christian music artist who's performed with superstars from Michael W. Smith to Toby Keith. Her new album is something that we can all get behind. It's called American Patriot. And the first single is Stand for Life. It's all about standing for human life, a pro-life song. Refreshing to see that. It's an honor to welcome Natasha Owens. Natasha, great, welcome thank and thank you. So great to be here. You're doing something that only Lee Greenwood, I think, has made especially, and that is to focus on music that is uplifting to America and about America. There's just not a whole genre of music out there where people say, I love my country and I don't mind who knows it. There's not. I was very shocked to know that Lee Greenwood did a, an album back in the 80s and that nothing else had been done since then. And I just love this country so much. I said, we just need to be able to focus on 
how great this land is. With all of our flaws, we're still the beacon of hope. Yes, we are. And it's so good to see that somebody is singing about it and making music about it. The song, uh, Stand for Life, that's a pro-life song. I mean, that's gutsy because a good chance that you might offend people by taking on that topic in a song. Well, you know, at this point, us as Christians, us as Americans have to stand up for what's right. And we just, we can't worry if we're going to be canceled or come against. We have to stand on a firm foundation. That's what the scripture tells us. And so um, when I originally had the idea, I said, I need to do a song about pro-life. And producers and songwriters said, we can't really take on that negative topic. And I said, I'm not wanting to really focus on the abortion part. I want to give an anthem and give courage for people to stand up mm -hmm. for what's right. And that's life. You know, you have been, I, I guess, blessed by invitations to go to a lot of places because people want to hear uplifting music about America. They want to hear someone that instead of taking a knee, takes a stand. And I think that's so positive. You've gone to places like uh, Mar-a-Lago, CPAC, Texas, CPAC, Orlando, uh, the Heroes Honor Festival, Susan B. Anthony, Pro-Life America, Black Tie Gala. Are you finding that there are people that say, Natasha, we want you to come because we know that the music is going to lift up America and remind us of what a great country we've got. Oh, I have been in such demand. I have never seen anything like it. Just all of these pro-life pro and patriotic and political type events. And I love going into a secular market and then sneaking one of my Christian songs in to an audience that wouldn't necessarily may not choose a church. I bring Jesus to them and uh, I love that. Well, we love it too. And we are so glad to have you with us. And uh, you're going to perform with uh, Trey and the band, and that's going to be pretty exciting. So Keith, as Natasha gets ready to sing, we want you to get ready. You can get ready and tell us how to get the music of Natasha Owens. For links to the new album, American Patriot, and much more, visit Huckabee.tv. You can also watch an exclusive performance of Stand for Life. Now, singing Freedom is the Song with Trey Corley and the Music City Connection and Mike on Bass, here's Natasha Owens. From the city streets and dusty roads of Texas To the glowing sunset light in Monterey If you listen to the frosty winds and fair things Or the gentle moonlight breeze at Kapalua Bay There is music in the air across America Two hundred years and still the tune is strong Pounding with the rhythm of a beating heart And freedom is the song We are free to speak our conscience and convictions And to choose the kind of work we wish to do to the sun, just where and how we live and worship And to strive to make our wildest dreams come true It's no wonder that this land is the envy Of every other nation in the world Just look what opportunity it offers Be on the land of 
Your own.